Leitner. Puts it up. You're listening to the Culture State Podcast. Get ready. Woo! Welcome, everybody, to another great episode of the Culture State Podcast. Listen, Dennis mm-hmm. and I are not dirty. If you're watching us on WRL Sports Plus or if you're watching on 99.9 Fans' YouTube page, we're not dirty. We're not wearing the same thing we had on last week. Oh, we just recorded everything in the same day. We just I mean, I, I, mean I do laundry. <laughs> you know, there, there's some people I mean, who are into the fashion. They're just like, oh, wait a minute. He had that on last week. Well, if they're paying that close attention, I appreciate you. That's yeah. all I'm going to say. Well, people are paying attention to you right now, Mr. Dennis Jamel Cox, <laughs> because you are the influencer. Um, okay. Let, first off, uh, take some yeah. time to brag about yourself and uh, about your TikTok page. Which is now getting a lot of views on uh, um, the social medias. All right. So to context, again, we are talking to Grant Hill, Duke, an NBA legend. So the Kane season, the date that we're recording this, had just ended. So I've been doing these little quick little videos. I posted on my Instagram reel. And I just, and our, our boss here at the fan, Sammy Simpson, is like, hey, look, TikTok is growing. Like, get on that platform, especially the stuff that you do. It's going to hit big there three videos I've done of me sort of sounding the siren at the Canes game while no one's there. So it's very like dull and quiet. You can barely hear it, but that's the whole point. I'm like, it's so loud. It's just like a joke. Like, yeah, the siren's really loud, but I'm barely even cranking it. So for the last game of the season for the game seven loss against the Rangers, I barely turned it and just kind of walked away sadly because the Canes season had ended. Well, of course, Rangers fans are like gotten, wind of it notice and commenting and all that stuff blah 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 so as of we're recording this it, it's been up for less than 24 hours and it's nearly a million views crazy i don't get it crazy. i do not get it the video's nine seconds long i don't worry i didn't dance i'm not i'm not gonna do that on tiktok but that's a, i mean i mean if someone paid me i would but say, that's the sweet spot though right you said yeah. nine seconds isn't like the sweet spot is like seven to fifteen Sure. For for a, a super viral video, I guess yeah. But let's say it's a nine second video, and that's it, man. And it's almost a million views as of this. By the time this episode comes out, it'll probably be over that. But I had another one. The first one I posted was like oh, now over two hundred thousand. Again, I don't know how this works. I'm not proud of me, Chris. I'm not I'm proud, proud of, of me. I'm proud of you. Well, thank you. Clap for somebody. this man. Dennis Jamel Cox, clap for him. I don't get it, man. So at the fan rookie, on listen. TikTok. These are the blessings that are are being bestowed upon you. Accept them, okay. receive them. Let's do it. Well, that is another subject. Let's talk about the subject at hand, which is our esteemed guest on the Coach State podcast today. His name is Grant Hill, and yeah. man, it was first off. It, shout outs to your girlfriend yes right 100 because of my girlfriend i would say 100 like, but like okay it was a good 60 percent. okay so you did all girl- the rest i did <laughs> i did one percent of this i did one percent of this i i wasn't going to give you a percentage i, I was going to i was going to just le- give no it's good we're going to share the rest of the percent oh okay got it but uh no your girlfriend tipped us off hey mm-hmm. grant hill is coming to durham and he has a book coming out yeah, I did not. I was not aware that he had a book coming out. Was um, so uh, we did some research, you know, hit a few lines and like, hey, can we get Grant Hill on the show? And now we have Grant Hill on the show. Yeah. Uh, to talk about his new book, his new book called Game uh, it's being published by Penguin Penguin uh, Random House uh, Publishing. And uh, in the book, uh, let me go through all these notes because there's a lot, a of, lot notes of notes on this. Um, but. It looks like it's going to be an amazing book. I read through like, you see all these pages. Yeah, a lot of pages. For those, I read through all of these pages. pages, and I was just like, "Where's the book?" Because I'm excited. Uh, Game by Grant Hill, so it's going to share all the great stories from his time at Duke, NBA, and beyond. Um, he had troubles with his uh, self esteem and his confidence. Mm-hmm. He talks about uh, his first date with his now wife Tamia, who of course was a singer. That uh, she still is a singer. I loved her music back in the day and how he forgot his wallet. So who paid for the bill? You're going to have to find out. Um, and then just different things talking about how his ankle injuries were, were very um, it was preventable and how just things were kind of different back then. And, uh-huh. and uh, it's so much that's in here. I can't wait till it comes out. Uh, the actual date is on sale June 7th. And um, 
I think that's the day or the day after this has come out. This yeah, well, this episode's June eighth, so books on sale. Yeah, so, so go book, book is on it. sale right now. You know, it's <laughs> I, he's going to get into this, but the the thing that really intrigued me a lot uh, reading the book, the notes on the book, um, about how someone who's such a high level athlete and has competed at such a high level and so successful at that level still struggles with or struggle with self esteem and self doubt. It's a it's amazing just how confidence is so fragile, uh, even with the people who do such great things at a high level. People are like, wow, I wish I could be like that person because they're so great and they're the best in the world of what they do. But even those people still have to battle that. It, and anyone can relate that uh, to their own personal lives in some way, shape, or form, whether it's even in our profession. It's like, you know what? I got to go on air. I still get nervous. I've done this thousands of times. Like Even for me personally, I've talked into this microphone thousands of times. And before I go live on air, I still get butterflies. Yeah. You know, it's like, can I do this today? It still gets you. It does. And the same thing happens for me in television. I mean, there are days where I come home and I'm like, God, I was awful. Why do I have yeah. this job? You know, mm -hmm. and I mean, you really do go through that type of stuff. Yeah. And people are shocked when they find out. They think that just because you have the job that you're this supremely confident person. And that's not always the case, man. And, you know, because uh, one reason why. If you're like me, you're your own worst critic. You notice oh, yeah. everything that you do wrong, and you can zero in on that, and you kind of beat yourself up for it. Oh, um, the worst is when you're on air and you're talking, you realize, like, I kind of – you're critiquing yourself while you're still on yes. air. and It's still in yes. your head. Oh, gosh, it's the and worst. And it makes you mess up even more. because yes! think <laughs> like, I need a break. Go to commercial. We just took one. Go anyway. <laughs> Man, man, it, it happens, uh, man, that is all too real. But we should we should probably do a whole episode on that though. That is that's crazy. I, I'm down. because sometimes and, and it's real. And I've been able to recognize it in other people when you see somebody messing up or you hear somebody messing up on something, mm -hmm. they are currently in their own head going through all the things that are and they're kind of having a mini breakdown. But their yeah. professionalism won't let them go all the way down. Mm -hmm. That has happened to me so many times on television and radio, and you just learn how to just go jet through it but after you're done that's all you can think about and it's like mm. it's frustrating yeah yep i get it's it frustrating man. i get it but this isn't about us this is about it's not about us so let's even though after, i'm an influencer yeah he, he is an influencer we can just call you the inf who's who's going by the influencer now that's a wasn't it chris jericho that's right he's going yeah. by the influencer now um so move over chris jericho we have another influencer we had the, the Jamel Appreciation Society. <laughs> <laughs> While we come up with uh, different merch and T-shirt ideas for Dennis, let's go ahead and uh, get to this interview after this break. <laughs> the, <laughs> after this break, we have Grant Hill right here on the Culture State Podcast. All right, Dennis, if you knew me uh, as a kid, uh -huh. right, I was uh, that kid in North Carolina who had never been you know, to Michigan or Detroit, but I was wearing uh, a Detroit Pistons hat and Fila shoes, right? There you go. It was all because of this man right here, because of Grant Hill, uh, because I was a Grant Hill fan growing up. And so it was weird, you know, of course, seeing a kid with the Pistons hat in North Carolina and also with the Fila shoes. But of course, with the influence of this guy and then what he's going on to do, so many great things has happened uh, in his career. Uh, and then also a new book that's coming out very soon called Game by Grant Hill. There's so many incredible stories that he's sharing from Duke, the NBA, and beyond. So many different uh, talking points. We'll talk about a few here. Mr. Grant Hill, thank you so much for joining our show today. Oh, man, thank you guys uh, for, for having me, and thank you for for supporting me with the Filas and, and the Teal Pistons uh, tank top back, back in the day. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, just wanted to ask really quick, since we are based in North Carolina, um, and I know that, you know, you spent a lot of time here in college when you were here, what were some of your favorite eating places? What was some of your favorite things to do around in, uh, in Durham and Chapel Hill and Raleigh to, to just go hang out or just have something to eat at or just have fun? Certainly had a limited budget back then, but, um, Bullock's barbecue was a staple. There was a place called the shrimp boat, uh, which was on 15501. Okay. Uh, a lady, uh, Johnson's Diner, which was over on Fayetteville Street, kind of right there, Fayetteville and Durham Freeway. 
Okay. Um, and it was like a soul food spot, but it was only open from like 1130 to one and you only got to go orders. Oh, wow. And you could only get one order oh, wow. and two sides. Um, we used to go to Kyoto's right there on 15501. Okay. okay. Satisfactions Pizza. Um, so those were kind of the spots, but you know, like yeah. I said, I had a limited budget back then. Yeah. <laughs> A little bit more limited budget. Now let's go and take into your time uh, at, at at Duke um, and at Durham. Um, what were some of the things, I know you mentioned this in your book, some of the lessons that you learned during your career. I know you mentioned about um, leading others, but also managing self-doubt. And that's something that's not really talked about, especially back in your time as an athlete. You know, we always think athletes are these overly confident people, but they do battle self-doubt. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you you know I think athletes go through that, particularly say an athlete struggling in a game mm-hmm. and their shots not on. Sometimes, sometimes doubt can creep in. Uh, I, I think with me it was a little bit deeper than just being an athlete. I think I just lacked self confidence in general and don't necess- don't don't know why or where that came from necessarily, and still haven't fully unpacked that. But as as a kid in my formative years, it was um, just not having that belief, whether it would be, you know, answering a question in class, raising your hand. And, and mm-hmm. even if you knew the answer, you know, and just, you know, I think one, not wanting to stand out, but then two, uh, struggling with, with, um, with some confidence issues, you know? And, um, and so I think basketball and sport, I mean, you want to compete, you want to do well. So you put on your armor, you know, and you learn how to fake it. You know, and sometimes Mm -hmm. faking it can give you confidence. Um, You know, I know, I think Coach K used to talk about body language. And he used to say how like a matador gets in the ring with a bull and always projects confidence. And um, there's there's something regal about how they present themselves. Their posture, it's elegant. And the bull can, can sense fear, you know. And so sometimes you have to do that to survive to put on a performance uh, if you're the matador. And in the process, it can give you confidence in a life or death, you know, situation. And so I kind of use that analogy, Um, you know, you put your armor on, you go to the park, you know, you're playing pickup, whatever, high school, college, you always are projecting and presenting confidence, even if in times you're not confident and you learn how to be really, really good at that. And I certainly, you know, learned how to do that. Well, it worked out for you in 96. You're talking about playing with some high-level players. You make the Olympic team. There's you know, Pippen, uh, Barkley, Shaq. Those guys are on the team, and you're on that team as well. I Did, did some of that self-doubt kind of go away when you're on that Olympic team, the fact that you made it, or were there questions of, do I belong here? Yeah, I was the youngest guy on that team. It was after my second year in the league. You know, I think, I think the beauty of, of sport, um, you know, a lot of people uh, who work, you know, you, you don't always necessarily, depending upon what line of work you're in, but you don't always get immediate results. And, and oftentimes it's, you know, you, you get results over time. Mm-hmm. And um, but the beauty of sports is that it's instant. You know, you come down to court and you're going against the defense. And if you make a nice move and score, well, you, you know what? You won that battle. And, uh, and so you're putting yourself out there, but also I think in the process of having success and winning and accomplishing certain things, you know, by the time I got to, to the NBA, I, I had, you know, I, I was ready to, 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 be, to be special. You know, I was ready for that. And I think I, that was part of my four year journey was getting comfortable with the idea of standing out. And, um, and so, you know, yeah, I, I felt like I deserved to be there. In some respects, in the 96 Olympics, I was in awe of some of my teammates. Um, but I went at them. I attacked. I uh, And I gained some confidence. You know, I gained confidence going against Scottie Pippen every day. Like, he was considered the, the, the you know, the, um, the gold standard when it came to uh, the small forward position. And so playing against him every day, like, I, I felt like I got better. But... 
um, by that point, '96, my confidence was 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 in good was in a good place, mm-hmm. um, and a lot of it had to do with I think the the many successes I had uh, on the basketball court. So Dennis and I are both. Uh, well, Dennis isn't 36 yet; he's about to turn 36. But I'm th- I just turned 36. Uh, we are a year younger than LeBron James, and I remember uh, when I first saw LeBron on an NBA court. Um, and seeing his game and he had been hyped up and everything. And one of the things I thought was, and he kind of plays like Grant Hill a little bit, like just from the forward position. And, um, and, I, and I was reading through some of the notes about your book. And I remember all the, the ankle injuries and the different things you kind of went through in your NBA career. And, um, and when you look back at, at your stats, you definitely had an above average NBA career. Like you played almost 20 years, all the all-stars, all the great things that's uh, happened in your career. But a lot of people still can't help but to think of, well, what if the injuries never happened, right? Like, where would people think about uh, about Grant Hill in the in that top ten of the NBA? Is that something that maybe you think about as well? Because there's also a part of here where you talk about how injury prevention wasn't really a thing; it was almost injury reaction beforehand. Uh, And if you would have played in an era where you know guys kind of uh, had the training staffs and took care of their bodies in a certain type of way. And uh, you would have still had that long NBA career that you had. Where do you think you end up in as far as like, you know, when people think about the top NBA players of all time? Well, I think, I think first, first of all, um, you know, my injuries could have been avoided. Like it was, it was, I mean, it's safe to say, I think once you read it and see what happened, like it was mismanaged. Mm-hmm. and could have been avoided. And even in that era, I could have played and avoided a lot of what I went through. Um, I I think the process of writing the book, um, it, it made me realize that I didn't, I didn't allow myself to, to enjoy is probably not the right word, but you know, you're, you're constantly chasing your goals, you're chasing legends, you're chasing banners, you're ch- all mm-hmm. these things that you want to do. And they're like the number one priority. And so early in my career in Detroit, um, I didn't allow myself to enjoy the accomplishments, mm-hmm. you know, the gold medal, the Olympics, the commercials, the mm-hmm. individual accolades. Like to me, we weren't winning. And so um, I don't, I didn't appreciate it sort of what I was able to do. I didn't appreciate sort of where I was, you know, to kind of come out of the gates and play like I did and establish myself and sort of be on this trajectory. Um, like I, I, I didn't win. So that was, you know, I didn't win. I didn't even come mm. close to winning. And so like, I wasn't happy and, and, and you know, I wasn't, I wasn't satisfied. I still wanted more. I, I didn't allow myself to, you know, stop and smell the roses, <laughs> you know? And, I, yeah. and so um, I think, you know, and then the injuries and all of that, like I didn't, like it was just kept moving forward, kept looking ahead, kept, so th- the book makes you go back and look and reflect and live in those moments uh, and find the lessons and share your story. And I think as a result of that, I've probably thought more about what could have been Um, but I I don't know if I gave myself permission or allowed myself to really think about that in great detail prior to, to writing this book. Um, I was looking forward, you know, I was looking ahead, um, not looking back at all. I say you would have been in the top 10. Oh, (laughs) we we would have looked at you like, like in that Kobe area for sure. Hey, I'll take it, man. Hey, (laughs) oh, you almost called me LeBron. So I I look at that as, yeah, I, I, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to do that. I apologize. <laughs> All good. All right. The book is called Game by Grant Hill, who's joining us here on Culture State. How did those injuries that you dealt with, the mismanagement, how did that impact your life off the court? Well, you know, obviously you have surgeries and, and mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the problem with sort of these season ending surgeries and six, seven, eight month recoveries is it, it takes a toll. You know, it takes mm-hmm. a toll. Uh, on your family, on your loved ones. And certainly there's a great sacrifice there. Um, you know, I think, I think obviously I was able to come back. I wasn't the same. And 
you know, you have physical restrictions and limitations now as a result of the multiple surgeries. Then the mindset changes, you know, prior to the injuries, you step on the court, you believe you're the best player on the court and that's going against anyone. And there's sort of a necessary athletic arrogance uh, that's needed to be great. And when you have four years and five surgeries and you like, you lose that confidence, you lose almost that belief or that, that arrogance, you know? And so you come back, And instead of feeling like I'm the best player on the court, it's almost like I'm just glad to be back, which in theory is a beautiful thing. You know, it's a beautiful thing to be grateful and thankful and enjoy every moment and all of that. Um, But I I lost a little bit of that edge and that edge is what pushes you and propels you to, to stand out. And and it's understandable. I mean, as you go through all of that, you're going to lose some of that. And, and so, um, you know, I think that, 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 that is the obvious, um, I forgot the question. I'm sorry. I'm rambling on. <laughs> no, um, I was saying like, how do the, the injuries and everything you dealt oh, with impact like your personal life and everything off the court on, well, I mean, now, I mean, I, I have restrictions. I, you know, I have an arthritic ankle. It hurts, mm-hmm. you know, it seems to hurt whenever it wants to hurt. Uh, it does not hurt all the, it doesn't bother me all the time, but it, you know, I can't be active or I can't do certain things. Um, you know, it hurts to play golf, you know, and go for a long walk. It, it's about, so, you know, it, it, it is sort of what it is. And that's part of the trade-off of, you know, you, you play 19 years in, in the NBA or any sport, you're going to feel it some point later. I didn't, Absolutely. I didn't think I'd feel it this soon. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, that's, that's the trade-off and I, I, I wouldn't trade it. You know I mean? I, 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 all of it, you know, all of it was incredible. Uh, even the disappointment, the, 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 the heartbreak, the, 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 the injuries, I mean, it, it's sort of, you know, it to who I am now and, uh, and who I am now is, has been greatly impacted and influenced by that. So, um, but yeah, no, my, my body is a mess <laughs> and, uh, I'm in shape. I mean, I still, you know, eat right and try to, but it's all cosmetic. There's nothing functional mm-hmm. on me anymore. <laughs> well you have the best function which is which is your brain and i know you do a lot of great things as well as well as you call basketball games and so you are able, able to call the ending and the run uh the ending run for coach k um and i i know this is this may not even be in the book but that last those last few games in the tournament how is it trying to keep your feelings and your uh emotions together for the fact that not only what what would happen win or lose for duke but for the fact that this was the ending of a, of a run and ending of an era of the coach uh, that you played for at Duke, that you are still really good friends with. Yeah. You know, it was really interesting. Um, you know, I've, I've called Duke games before wins mm-hmm. and, and losses. And so, you know, that, that, you know, I won't say it's easy, but I mean, it, 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 it I've been able to manage that, you know, mm-hmm. when Duke won their championship in 2015, I was on the call. Uh, when Zion lost to Michigan State in 19, I was on the call. You know, so I've done some some highs and some lows, um, but but this one was was different because of what you said, and it really didn't hit me until we were at the Big Ten tournament, and I was with Jim Nance, and we were prepping the semi uh, the, the quarterfinals on that Friday at the Big Ten conference tournament in Indianapolis, and he said, "Look, there's a strong chance that our group." will broadcast Duke and have all of Coach K's games. Wow. And there'll be six opportunities for you to call his very last game where he loses. And there'll be one opportunity for you to call his last game and it's a win. Mm. And so he said, look, as just Jim Nance talking, you know, I, I covered all of his championships, all five of them I called. But he said, people are going to want to hear from you. You mm. played for him. And I'm like, oh, crap. Like, now I'm nervous. Like, you know, I ain't even no no pressure. Like, like, now I'm like, oh, man. Like, like so now, you know, he told me that. And I'm like, I wish he didn't tell me that, you know, because. That, you <laughs> yeah. know, and, and so um, the first game they played in the tournament, it, I can't remember who the team, uh, Cal State Fullerton. Mm. I wasn't concerned. I mean, I watched the tape. I watched the game. 
Uh, I scouted them. Like I felt like we would win that, and we did. But then the next game was Michigan State. Yeah. And even in our production meeting the day of the game, you know, we're going over scenarios in case Duke loses. And so, okay, what happens? You know, typically Tracy Wolfson, the sideline reporter, gets the winning coach walking off the floor. And then we'd have 10 minutes before she could interview Coach K. And so all these different things. So that was when it kind of hit me. It was like, oh, man, like this could happen. Thankfully, those next three games, it didn't happen. And we won pretty convincingly down the stretch. Mm -hmm. Um, But the Duke Carolina game in the Mm. the NCAA tournament or in the Final Four, it was like you get lost in the game. And it was such a good game. It was a close game. Absolutely. Um, And then they lose kind of at the end within the last minute. So you didn't really have time to to, to get into your emotions or whatever. I mean, like if, if Duke was down 15 with three minutes left, okay, now we can start talking about it and it's real, but it kind of snuck up on us at the last minute. So mm. it didn't, it, you know, so yeah, I mean, you have a job to do as a broadcaster, but, but anyway, the, the whole, the whole journey, the whole final four run, uh, it was special to witness it, to be around the team, to see coach on off days uh, to broadcast his last games. I mean, it was an honor and a privilege. Uh, certainly, there were a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions. It was surreal. Um, it was almost like, wow, I can't believe this is happening. You know, you you felt yeah. that he coached forever, you know? Like, yeah. You know, and you knew it wouldn't happen. But, I mean, just, you know, I was 25-plus years removed from playing, and my coach was still there. And, and that's all wow. I've ever known. And so – uh, but it was a great thrill, and it only would have been better if uh, if we could have sent him out with another championship. Yeah. yeah, it's it's an amazing story. I don't envy the position that you were in at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, the book is called Game by Grant Hill, our guest here on Culture State. Grant, we really do appreciate your time, good sir. Wish we could talk to you a little bit more. Um, but we just go. Everyone got to go check out this book. I know it's yeah. available. Uh, basically, everyone can pick up a book. So go to a local bookstore if it's there. If not. People can buy it online, I'm sure. There it is. Grant Hill, thank you so much. We appreciate it. All right, guys. Thank you. As Dennis keeps checking how many views he has on his video. It's so dumb. We want to thank. <laughs> it's so stupid. We want to thank Grant Hill and Penguin Random House for uh, for the time today uh, and having him on the show. Th- this was really big. This is yeah, arguably probably if not one of maybe the biggest interview that we've had. Yeah, it's up there. I mean, if you look at Petey Pablo, Matt, Jeff Hardy, um, Charlotte Flair, the Matt Doherty, these are some of the biggest ones that we've had, Yeah, Um, which is awesome. This is great. Grant Hill, uh, he will forever be in Duke lore basketball for the guy through the past the Leitner. Yeah. Um, That's the thing. Like everyone talks about Leitner shot that passed out to be perfect. Grant Hill threw it. Uh, we want to thank him for for coming on. Thank you again to Penguin for making this yes. happen, and um, hopefully, and my girlfriend for pointing out the fact that hey, he's coming to Duke. He's got a book coming out. You should get this guy on Culture State. I was like, it's Grant Hill, Chris. Shout outs to her, and this all came together pretty fast for us too. Really That's did. the thing. A, a, a interview the level or the caliber of Grant Hill typically takes us. Months. A month or more to kind of set up. <laughs> this was like a week and a half. And yeah. so I'm, from from when you told me, oh, Grant Hill's supposed to be here, to me like, okay, let me check on it, and to getting a response back and saying, hey, how about this day, this time? Yeah, that's, it was, this was amazing. So thank you to your girlfriend for that. Uh, she's 60% of this, and me and you will share the other 40 thing. But I'm not doing my thing on TikTok like you are. So make sure you follow him on TikTok. At the fan rookie and on Twitter and Instagram, follow at Culture State Pod. Follow at Chris Lee TV. I guess we got to do a Culture State TikTok. That's not there yet. It's um, gonna happen. Maybe our first yeah, video should be the you and I doing the Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy bit. You're right. There it is. You're right. Uh, and please give us five stars if you're listening on Apple. And um, yeah, we thank you so much, Mr. Grant Hill. Thank you. You guys, be safe. The Culture State Podcast, part of the Capital Broadcasting Podcast Network, with new shows coming out every Wednesday. 
Download and subscribe from wherever you get your podcasts, including the WREL Sports Fan app.